first and foremost, I want to congratulate you on the release of Medicare Simplified, what retirees need to know about Medicare in 100 pages or less. Kind of lengthy, kind of lengthy, uh, but congratulations on your first book, Ashby. The subtitles are always lengthy, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And I think that you also need to do what retirees and advisors need to know about Medicare in 100 pages or less. Maybe that'll be version 2.0. There we go. There we go. Um, so today, I, I real quick, I want to hit on the book because I mentioned you could change the title to include advisors because Medicare is an area that admittedly, me being an advisor, not a strong point. Um, I don't want to learn about all the parts. I'd rather defer it out to those experts that are out there. But there's probably a, a lot of value advisors can bring just knowing the benefits and being able to talk about it um, intelligently. And from what I gather, reading through this in less than an hour or so, basically everything I need to know is wrapped up in this one book. So I'm not going to sell the supplement, but I can do a better job as an advisor just by this short book that you put together. So let's spend a little bit of time about kind of what the book is about, why'd you write it? And then most importantly, when we get done with that, we'll get into the whole book writing processes, which is probably what a lot of the advisors are interested in is what, what was that process like? But first, tell us about the book. How'd you come up with the idea? Um, what's it about? Give me the spiel. I started out to write a 300 page book on retirement, in all honesty. And when I, I was probably... I don't know, 20% of the way through writing the 300 page novel that nobody would ever read um, and realized exactly that, that nobody would ever read a 300 page book on retirement. At least most people wouldn't. And I feel that way because in general, people don't want to sit down and read a 300 page book on retirement. What they are searching for is an answer to a question. And so it's like, all right, well, Medicare is coming up. Well, I should probably learn something about it. So the goal was, and don't ask me why I punished myself with a book on Medicare to start out with, um, but I found that it's an area I, you know, most of the audience, at least uh, is familiar with you, um, knows that I'm all I do is retirement. So I've answered a lot of questions on Medicare through the years. And so I felt like that was an area that I could really add value because it's just kind of a black box in a lot of ways. And I don't even know a lot of advisors who are well-versed in Medicare. And through the process of kind of research for the book, which we'll get, we'll get to that um, kind of how the process of writing the book, but through the process of researching it, I found that, I mean, I read probably three, four books on Medicare and all of them were very disjointed. There was not a lot of like, help me figure this out. It was like, all right, well, if I need to answer a specific question, then I have to search and search and search for these answers. So what the book is really trying to do is I wanted to get well, the idea was retirees. I've actually found that there's quite an audience for advisors here. Um, many thanks to you in that regard. But I wanted to get people to 98% in less than an hour and a half. So whereas I spent hours and hours and hours and hours both reading books, reading Medicare.gov, reading Medicare Interactive, reading all these different websites, which was a miserable experience, um, mind you. But uh I wanted to be able to provide 98% of the education in a short distilled read. So that was kind of the thought process. I started out with a 300 page book, decided that and pivoted to a, uh, a shorter, more concentrated book. And it really does cover it all. And it's all very easy to follow. It almost looks like a blog post with all of the, you know, subheadings and bullets and everything to make it real easy to follow. So you, it, you know, it, it is easy. I definitely, know this will be a book that I reference with my retirees. Because again, I I always refer, there's a guy in town that I could refer to that when the topic came up, I said, hey, there's a lot of nuances. It changes year to year. I don't want to give you any bad advice. I'm going to connect you with him and let it go. But now I know that if what they come, I when they come back with a recommendation for what they're going to get, I can at least feel confident that I'll know whether or not they're getting good advice or not. So it's it'll be a good It'll be a good tool. So 
scare some of the, scare the advisors out there into realizing how little they know about Medicare. Just a couple of things that they're going to find in the book that would be a lot of value or something that they really need to be aware of that they may not just to show the like how important this book really is. If, if you're an advisor working with retirees. Well, I think that there's a couple, I found that some of the most valuable conversations I have with clients were on the topic of Medicare. Not that I know everything. I do the same thing as you. I refer it out. I don't do anything with it, but just being able to have a really educated, straightforward conversation and help clients understand what they're getting themselves into is super valuable for them. Just one thing, like most people don't even know what Medigap is. Even advisors, very few advisors know what Medigap is. And that that's actually, you know, your, your two primary options for supplemental coverage are Medicare Advantage plans and Medigap. Well, the only thing that gets marketed to retirees are Medicare Advantage plans. So most people just don't even realize that Medigap hardly exists, which astounds me. But when you get into it, I would bet you that most clients who hire an advisor probably should be using Medigap because it is much, in my opinion, it is more bang for your buck. Well, because, you know, there's a variety of reasons for it. But for one, if, you know, what's the number one you th- thing you hear that retirees want to do when they retire? I'll give you one guess. Travel. Travel. They always want to travel. Well, if you own a Medicare, if you get a Medicare Advantage plan, you're probably limited to your local network of hospitals and physicians. But if you're going to travel in retirement, then a Medigap policy will cover you anywhere Medicare is accepted, which is pretty much everywhere. I want to say it includes 95% of doctors. So if your clients are going to travel, there's a high likelihood that a Medigap plan is what's best for them. And then you can get into the details beyond that. You need, you know, as an example, there are some tripping points. Like a lot of people are familiar with Plan F, but Plan F is not no longer open to newly eligible retirees. It's a, if you turn 65 before 2020, you're still eligible. But if you didn't, then you don't. Then you, you know, your most comprehensive option is Plan G. Then you get into the Part D plans and the enrollment of not only Medigap, but what the enrollment period is for Medigap, what the enrollment period is for your Part D plans, guaranteed issue and guaranteed access rights, getting into parts A and part B, what are the enrollment periods based on certain circumstances? So the goal of the book is to jump into all of that and help in a very short period of time, help you get up to speed on what the rules are, what the best options for for most clients are, like even the chapters are, who might be right, you know, who might a Medigap plan be right for? Who might a Medicare Advantage plan be right for? Because while there isn't one answer, most people can find themselves fitting into a specific box, fitting into a specific group and really help you identify, um, you know, and on a general basis, what plan might be best for them. At that point, they can have an edu- a really educated conversation with a Medicare specialist to actually help them narrow down and get a specific plan. All right. So that, that's enough there. You rattled off a bunch of stuff that I would have to consult the book to be able to answer. So that's the evidence and the fear that I want to drive advisors to go out and support you and buy your book. Because you're a friend of mine. Even if you weren't a friend of mine, it's a good book and I want to see other people succeed. So if you're an advisor and you couldn't answer those questions without hitting Google, then you need this book. And I'm going to encourage you to go out and buy it. And I'm also going to encourage you that when you go buy it, after you read it, go back and leave a review. It's awkward to ask for reviews, so I'm going to ask for you for Ashby because that's the only way this stuff gets found. Like We're all interested in SEO and all these hacks to get our websites found. Well, reviews are the best way to help books be sold. So we're all in this together. Ashby's a good advisor. He's got a good mission behind this book. It's going to help people out, whether it's advisors or or clients. So when you read it, after you buy it, go ahead and leave a review. Help him out. Um, You've done your good deed. And the universe, karma, God, whatever you want to result to, will come back and repay you for that down the road. So um, go buy Medicare Simplified. Link will be in the in the, the show notes. I'll have it in the notes uh, in the comment section of YouTube as well for the video. So you have no excuse not to go buy it. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys heard that, but the market just closed. Uh, my, my bell went off for think or swim. Um, so let's get into the actual nuts and bolts of writing a book because honestly – that's what a lot of people listening to this are going to be interested in. Not to downplay your book, but 
this is about advisors of tomorrow and we're trying to grow and, and do things to help us uh, get better and grow. Let's talk about writing the book. First question is, would you do it again? You hear a lot of people who write a book and say, I'll never put myself through that torture. Would you do this again? You know, it's funny because I've heard this statement from a variety of people is that everyone wants to have written a book, but nobody actually wants to write a book. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a pretty grueling process. I won't lie. I mean, it probably took me five months to write a little piddle, you know, <laughs> kind of a piddly 94 page book. So it takes a lot of time and effort. I mean, in, to go in, in addition to the research. Now that said, absolutely, I would do it again, but I write a lot and I'm very comfortable writing. I'm far more comfortable writing than I am in any other medium. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. I mean, in fact, I'm already probably 75% of the way done with book number two already. Um, unfortunately, because of the release of Medicare Simplified, it's kind of stalled. I've probably been at 75% for almost a month, which is starting to wear on me. Um, so I'm excited to start jumping back into writing book number two. So absolutely is the short answer. I think I would struggle writing a book. Uh, we were talking about this beforehand and my shiny object syndrome that I suffer from. Blogs are perfect for me because I can, or video or you know, other shorter forms, because I can get my thought out. There is a lot of forgiveness when it comes to editing and grammar and spelling when it comes to a blog versus a book. So I can just put it out there and go. The actual writing and editing and rewriting would drive me crazy because I am not a very patient person when it gets about something I'm excited. When I get done with it, I just want to put it out. Like I will edit this podcast tonight to be able to put it out probably tomorrow because I'm excited about it. Like I don't want to wait for it. Um, so for me, I think writing a book would be, would be difficult. Um, but it, I'll, I'll stop you there for a second and play devil's advocate as I like to do with you. But <laughs> the, it's a tedious process, but it's very accomplishable even for, you know, somebody who doesn't really enjoy writing. I mean, I think of it as, you know, my, my setup, and I think you probably wanted to ask this question anyways, what was the process? Well, my goal was I set for myself was to write one chapter per week, which when you see the lengths of the chapters, that's not unachievable. I mean, it's like writing an extra blog post or two, depending on the chapter. I mean, some chapters are longer than others, but, you know, I set it up to make it achievable and make it like set little mini goals is to sit there to say, okay, I'm going to write a book. That's intimidating. But to say, OK, well, I'm going to write one chapter this week and it's going to be a crappy chapter. And then next week I'm going to write another crappy chapter. And then the next week, another, and another, and another. And on you go until, you know, next thing you know, you've written the rough draft of your first book. And it's it makes it really achievable when you break it out into shorter, smaller goals. I mean, we're, we're accustomed to doing that as advisors for both our clients and as, you know, people who are trying to accomplish our own business goals. So if you approach writing a book the same way, it makes it very doable. And I think, and not that you necessarily are passionate about Medicare, but you're, it's, it's in your world. It's part of what you do. I think if I found a subject that I was passionate about, like excited to write about, it might be a little bit easier to go through that process. And I just haven't found, like I've, I've written down, I think it'd be fun to write a book, but I have no idea what I would write about. And I have no idea who my audience would be. So it's kind of hard for me to, to think about writing a book. But if I found an idea that I thought I could make an impact by writing a book and it would last and people would want to read it, then maybe I would be able to get through my shiny object syndrome and focus more on it. And I do think that you're exactly right. When I think write a book, I think sit down and then I end with this. I don't think about the micro actions, the 1% better every day or the 1% more every day uh, if you're a James Clear fan to finally get to the book. Um, and it's not that you have to – I would go into thinking I've got to write my chapter, my, my final version of the chapter this week, not I've got to write my crappy version of the chapter this week and then I'll go back later on and fix it up or pay somebody to fix it up for me. Um, so I think that's a, that's, I think it's a very um, important – concept for people thinking about writing a book to think about is it's not sit down day one day two you're done with the book it's a slow grind and you just get the framework out and then you go back and refine and then you go back and refine and then you have your final product well and to provide some context for for the listeners in the sense that what was the process of getting started so i mentioned before that i read probably four or five different books on medicare not 
an enormously fun process. Uh, I'm passionate about planning for retirement. I'm not as passionate about knowing everything there is to know about Medicare. I'm glad I know what I know now. But, you know, it's kind of like studying for the CFP. I didn't enjoy studying for that either. But, you know, it was part of the process. So, but what I did was as I would read through these books and different resources, like, I I mean, I must have killed a tree or two just in terms of printing off articles from Medicare.gov and everywhere else, in addition to reading the books that I read. But all I would do is as I'm going through these things is I would highlight star pages. I mean, these books, these Medicare books are like, I mean, in the marginalia everywhere. I mean, it's, I have notes everywhere. And then once I had all that, I could really figure out what the points were that I really wanted to nail down. And then I could create an outline. So I didn't start with the idea that, okay, I'm going to write a book on Medicare. What's chapter one? I read everything I could read on Medicare first. And then I figured out what are the, what are the key points? Like what are the basically start to give myself chapters. And then once I had that, you know, I, I created an outline of chapters and then I said, okay, chapter one, this is what chapter one is. And then I would go back through my notes and I would try to write chapter one through the course of a week, like I said, and then I would figure out, okay, this is chapter two. And I tried to make it in terms of try to make it flow as well as I could through a lot of these issues. So that was kind of the beginning process is really reading everything. I, I picked it. And the reason I picked Medicare is it was an area I was kind of weak. So it was an area I already needed to learn more about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's certainly not my passion project. It wasn't what I, uh, I wouldn't have envisioned that would have been my first book. Uh, but it was an area I wasn't as strong as I wanted to be. So it was an easy place to start researching. And I figured at worst, even if I didn't write a book on it, I would at least know what I felt was required for clients. And we'll get more here in a second to more of the process. Like, how did you edit it? Who was your publisher? How'd you do all of that? But I want to kind of uh, hit a few more stops along the way as we get there. So Benjamin Brandt has been on the podcast before advocating that every advisor should have a podcast. Our friend Danny Fava at TD Ameritrade, same thing, whether it be a flash briefing or a podcast, like every advisor could use these. Do you think every advisor should have a book? I don't think every advisor should have anything. I think you do what works for you. I mean, I think it was you, you wrote a post. It was you do you. Um, you know, I'm a writer. I, well, I even have trouble saying that. I do like to write. I enjoy writing. So I write this, a lot. This book right here says you are a writer. <laughs> if I'm a published author, I still don't, uh, I don't know if I connect with being a writer. I like to write. Do I think I would be great on CNBC all the time? And probably not. I'm no Josh Brown, you know, but. So do I think that every advisor should do anything? No. But if you think you have a book in you, you probably have a book in you. Mm-hmm. You know, if that's something that's on, you know, your radar, you know, there's there's an inner voice in all of us. Right. It, you want to write a book. You just said that you've always wanted to write a book, but you don't know what you write about, what your audience is. But the point is, is that it's in your mind. It's mm-hmm. something you want to accomplish. Like. I'll tell you that when I, I didn't think a whole lot of anything until I actually got my first copy of my book. And I was like, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty cool feeling. So if you feel like you have a book in you, then I think you probably do. If you don't connect with that idea, then you probably don't. I mean, my goal isn't to convince anybody whether they should or whether they shouldn't. If you think you have one, then you probably do. When you went into it, what were your, like, what were your expectations? Like, did you go into it thinking I want this to be a New York Times bestseller or because I think that also, you know, thinking of the other means that advisors are putting themselves out there, podcast blogs, like people are, I think, beginning to realize you don't need to have a podcast audience like Joe Rogan. You look at Adam Schmela, a very low number of like he's transparent about it, very low number of listeners to his podcast but they are all optometrists and they are all potential clients and they are all becoming clients. So you don't need to have this grandiose result from it. And I think maybe we fear, Oh, my book won't be good enough, but if we have reasonable expectations and the next question kind of ties into marketing, which may bring those expectations to the table going into it, like what were you hoping to accomplish from it? 
So I actually was going to write the first, the 300 page novel that nobody was going to read. I actually was going to write that with the idea that it wouldn't make any money. It would just be a business card, which is a very uh, time expensive uh, way to make a business card. But the more I thought about it, the more I liked the idea of these shorter focused books. And the more I view it as, you know, I don't want to call it a side hustle because I'm not sure that's what it is, but it's a separate business. I mean, I look at writing books now as a hopefully what will become a um, secondary income stream over time. And my goal is to write about I haven't decided somewhere between six to ten of these books. And they all they all relate to retirement planning, which drive business directly back to my retirement planning practice. But at the same time, I want these books to be beneficial to the end user so that somebody who's a DIYer, uh, you know, wants to do it themselves on their retirement planning, that they can buy my books, spend very minimal, num- very minimal amount of money and can hopefully get a really great education, a really great set of frameworks from which to make really good retirement decisions. That's really the end goal. I mean, it, if I can make a difference in the lives of a DIYer who will never hire me anyway, which is fine, they don't have to. But if I can make a difference in somebody's life, and oh, by the way, you know, hopefully make a dollar doing it, then I feel like we've all won. It's been good. I've, I've provided those frameworks. And by design, I hope people buy it and I hope people use it. So I, I view this as a side hustle um, that lead that conveniently leads right back to my personal retirement planning practice. So you mentioned the business card that ties into marketing. How does the book fit into your kind of marketing strategy for your business? So the first thing I'm going to do, I actually haven't even gotten my author copies yet. They take way like everybody else has gotten their books, but um, I guess if you, yeah, I'm not a prime. I mean, I am a prime customer, but apparently author copies do not qualify for prime. Um, But uh, I haven't even got my author copies yet. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to send three to every every client. Uh, I guess three is my kind of thought process. You know, and it's going to include a note that says, you know, obviously one copy is for you. I hope that you'll pass the other two along to, you know, to friends and colleagues, family members that you think might uh, that it might be applicable for that might be valuable information to share with them Um, with the hope that you know, that opens up an an interesting conversation between my client and their friend, family member that, that may be a prospective client. Um, So that's, that's going to be kind of order of business. Number one, I'm going to send it to centers of influence that I have here in the area that, you know, maybe need to get more up to speed on Medicare uh, with the idea that it puts me at a different level of expertise in my area of specialization that they may be more interested to to start sending business my way if, if it is appropriate. So as of the moment, I mean, that's, you know, then there's the, I think you brought to my attention in our kind of uh, pseudo co-coaching call um, where, you know, this, a supplementary, a supplementary audience, maybe even the primary audience is advisors, you know, helping advisors learn everything they need, 98% of what they need to know about Medicare in an hour and a half. Um, You know, so, that brings up a whole other marketing template of uh, how I go about marketing the book within the industry. Uh, so you would probably know more about that than I would, but uh, you know, we're going to be, I'm going to be going down that rabbit hole trying to, um, you know, get into the hands of more advisors as well. Cause I think it could be really helpful to the advisory world as well. I still, I still stand by, I think there are more purchasing client, purchasing customers that are advisors than do-it-yourselfers. And I think that the business card giveaway, credibility, positioning you above other advisors around with the client side is where the book comes in. Um, yeah, you'll have you'll have some clients that will but still buy just to support it for you. But I, I think that, to your point, unless you're a do-it-yourselfer, you're going to rely on your advisor to do it. And they're going to refer to somebody else. You're I don't think they're going to be going out to buy it. They might even be searching for it um, because they're just expecting who they're working with to be able to help them. But the advisor is the one who's asked to answer these questions and we don't know where they are. So we're going to start searching for it. Hopefully being on podcasts like this and other ones that you're able to get on will help spread the word amongst the advisors 
And I really do think that it is going to be more advisors that buy, but that does not diminish the fact that you originally wrote this for consumers because it'll benefit consumers. It's going to elevate you in the eyes of your clients. They already think highly of you, but now their financial advisor wrote the book on Medicare. Like the, this is the book. I don't know if it's still there, but it was number one on Amazon in the Medicare section. <laughs> uh, but still, like nonetheless, like that is a lot of value. Um, and then when you go to your COIs, if they have two advisors that they have a, you know, a CPA has a client that is asking them about Medicare because they have their finances. Are they going to send it to the person who probably knows about it or the person who wrote the book? The person who wrote the book. So I definitely think that the business card value is there and the side business of the advisors could be pretty good as well. All right, let's get to let's get to the nuts and bolts. So you told us a little bit about your schedule. A chapter a week was the goal, but even just give us more insight. Like, did you write at home? Did you go to the office? Like, what was your routine to get you yourself in the mood to write for the book? Because I have a routine. So what was your routine? Uh, where did you do it? How did you find the time? And then we'll hit the editing, publishing, those things after that. So I did most of the research, uh, note taking, all that in the evenings. Uh, I'm still lucky. I mean, I have a seven year old and three year old. Uh, I think apparently we're unique in the sense that our kids are in bed by eight thirty. Um, so you know, by eight thirty, I have the rest of the evening. Now I I tend to go to bed around ten thirty or eleven, um, but that gives me you know minimum an hour, even if I spend the other hour with, you know, obviously my wife. Um, but I spent a lot of those evenings where, you know, I, I would put the kids would, we put the kids in bed and I would go read and I would try to get as much done as I could. I mean, I'm thankful that, you know, my wife, Beth is on board with the whole process and knowing what I was getting myself into. So, you know, she certainly didn't take offense when I didn't come down and, and uh, spend that time with her. I, I spent a lot of time reading and researching and note taking. Um, as far as writing goes, I did write a lot of it in the evenings and on weekends when, you know, when I wasn't playing dad, um, which um, which was not as much time as you might think, mm -hmm. um, because I am a very active dad. Weekends are for the boys. Um, not in the bar school way, but, um, you know, for my kids, it's super important to me. So I would spend, you know, if I had some free time here at the office, I would open up my word document and, you know, put on whatever the FM sound is that, uh, the brain FM, that's what it is. And I would roll for an hour and just try to pump out as much as I could. But my thing was, if I didn't finish what I needed to finish, you know, Monday to Friday to get my chapter done, then I did spend more time on weekends. So there was an incentive for me to get what, get done what I needed to get done. And that's why I think that holding myself to the goal of a chapter a week was really helpful because otherwise one chapter would have bled into two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and it would have never gotten done. So that's kind of the process that I followed. Um, so did you, did you lean on any apps or any sp specific technology to help with the note taking or anything? Or did you just old school as you are notebook and how, how did you manage all that? Almost none of it was in a notebook. It was all in the margins or of the books. And I would put a little star in the top right corner of every page that I knew I'd want to refer back to. So I wouldn't. So when I'm flipping through the book, there was an easy marker. You know, OK, this was a relevant point. Um and I wrote a lot inside the books, you know, all the articles that I printed out, um, I would do the same thing. I'd write notes all over it. And, you know, I would try to, once I had an idea, once I started to get an idea of what my chapters were, I would also write on the top of the page, like, this is for this chapter, this is for this chapter. So that that way, when I was looking back through, it's a lot, it was a lot easier for me to find the information that I wanted to make sure was included. Anything about your routine that you would change? So, yes, um, only one, though, and that is like as I'm starting to get revamped up writing book number two is I'm trying to dedicate minimum an hour a day during the workday to pump out, pump out some writing. Um, and that's in addition to all my other writing that I do, which is the blog and the monthly memo and 
everything else. So, you know, I'm trying to block out an hour a day, no questions asked that I can work on the book. So that's, that way it's not so much me trying to fill gaps. It's me being very purposeful toward the writing process. Okay. And obviously every writer has to find what works for them. But I think hearing what one person did that worked for them, what, what didn't gives us a framework to, to try different things. At least that's the way I work. Like very few things that I do are original ideas at the start. It's something that I see somebody else doing. I take that as kind of a framework and then I make it my own. Then it becomes original. But the, the idea of how to write or what I do started somewhere else and it's kind of morphed. Um, so let's get into the, like the actual production of the book. So you've, you've got your rough draft. You've been typing it up. Uh, did you do your own editing? Did you hire an editor? How did you get that cleaned up? So it goes without saying, I think probably for anybody who has written a book that they've read it more than anybody else. I probably read my own book about, gosh, 30 plus times, even once it was written. So I would, I would uh, go back through, I'd read the entire thing and edit it as I go through, both trying to find um, typos, things I need to reword, um, anything and everything you could possibly think of that I did my own editing process for probably the first 30 times until I got it to where I felt it was pretty good. And then I sent it to my editor. Uh, now, mind you, that is the only part of the process that I didn't have to pay for that in, you know, most other people have to pay for. And that's because my mom edited it. My mom is an English teacher. Um, so she knows all the grammar and <laughs> Uh, even though I told her, I said, I still very much want to keep it in the right. My mom would have probably changed more of my writing style um, because it's not perfect grammar. I told her, but I specifically told her, look, I want it to sound like somebody is speaking to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's that's how I write. That's my style. And so she offered, I mean, she found it's amazing. You can edit your book to death and there's still a lot wrong. So my mom found a ton. She made significant improvements to the book, both from a, a rewording sentences to, you know, grammatical or punctuation errors. Um, so I'm super thankful for that. Um, so that was, she was the final edit. I would, I then made the corrections, sent it back to her. She went, did one more run through. And then, uh, and then once that was done, um, the book was already formatted to a large degree for Amazon. I know you know you wanted to get into this anyway, so I'll just jump right in. That was where we were going, so perfect. So I only published on Amazon because you can self-publish on Amazon. So I am not a paid author in that regard. Um, Amazon doesn't pay for anybody to self-publish on their platform, but it also doesn't cost you anything, so it's pretty awesome. But... I would. I had already formatted it about probably ninety percent of the way there. If you just Google, you know, if you go into MS Word, which is I wrote my whole book in in a Word document and um, save it to the cloud, so that way I could edit it. I could work on it whether it was on my work computer or my home computer or whatever. It was always available. The most current version was always available. But I did. I set up. You know, if you just search inside Word uh, for book template. Boom, you'll have a book template. But then if you search for Amazon Microsoft Word template, they'll give you instructions on how to reformat it to be my book is, is a six by nine book. So there are instructions that Amazon provides that you can get to um, set your book up for Amazon publishing. So I did that and got it probably 90% of the way there. Uh, Fintwit, a uh, friend, Rocky Ziegler gave me um, the, you know, he's written a couple books. And so I reached out to him and said, Hey, um, you know, who did you use for formatting? And so he gave me uh, generously offered the, the same person right off of Fiverr uh, that could get my book from 90% to a hundred percent in terms of formatting. She did a beautiful job. And then um, I also had a book cover design by somebody on Fiverr. Uh, for those that are interested, the total investment for those two things, both the book cover and the formatting, was I think one hundred and sixty dollars total. Um, so that is my total financial investment into the book. Um, so I think that's pretty solid. Most people think it's 
far more expensive, but it's actually not because uh, because of the way that Amazon has done it. I was going to ask, so I'm glad that, that you put it out there. And then distribution is all going to go through Amazon, so they handle all the shipping for you. Right, and so it's it's even better than that in the sense that I have no cost for carrying the book there. Amazon is unbelievable in the sense that they, in a normal non-coronavirus world, um, if you buy my book and my book is prime eligible, so if you buy my paperback, it's still to you in two days. But Amazon carries no inventory. It is print on demand. Oh, wow. So they will, you know, you order just one book and Amazon will print it and mail it to you. It's still to you in two days. I'm mind blown on how they do that, but that's what they do. Um, so there's no carrying cost. There's no nothing. I just have a book out there that anybody can buy at any moment and Amazon will print it um, and send it to you. So, so yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive. <laughs> so I'm, sh- I'm sure people are wanting at this point to know they don't do that for free. So of your book sale, how much goes to Amazon and how much do you pocket? So they pocket 40% above printing costs. Um, so I get 60% after printing costs is really what it comes down to. And on Kindle versions, I get 70% period because uh, there's no cost to, to Amazon for that. Um, so if it sells well, it could be it could be pretty profitable. And if it doesn't, I'm not out any more money. I mean, the, the money I've got into it is a sunk cost, um, which has already been covered at this point. And um, so, yeah, so there's no other no other costs out there. So it's my. So just because you can already calculate the Kindle amount, uh, my paperback royalties are rough are, are not far off. So, you know, it's about 350 a book is really what it comes back to. I mean, you're not going to get wealthy on it. Um, but for for all the work having been behind me, you know, from here on out, it's all a plus. So it's it's pretty it's pretty neat setup that they have. What you should do, I'm inspired by the painting behind me of Nipsey Hussle. You should write your your series and on the last book, you should sell the book for a thousand dollars a copy. So I don't know if you know this. So Nipsey Hussle, he produced everything on his own. He was self-published and everything. And he did one album and it was $1,000 for an album. Like stupid. And he sold them all out. And actually Jay-Z bought like 10 of them or something like that. So it's almost like everybody's got this collection. And then to get the final Ashby Daniels book, you got to drop this ridiculous amount of money. And maybe you only sell four or five of them, but you end up making the same amount of money. The risk you run is you look like a jerk. (laughs) Uh if I have half the uh, following is Nipsey Hustle, I'll consider it at that point. You have all the all the retirees want that last book tapping into their RMD to to be able to buy it. <laughs> I do. I do want to mention two things though. Um, so one is, you know, that's the the financial investment is minimal, but the time investment is hundreds of hours. Mm-hmm. Um, so it sounds like, oh, that's really expensive. I'll just start writing a book. Well. You're talking about hundreds of hours. I'm, that's in no way, shape, or form a discouragement. By all means, please, I encourage, I implore people to write a book if that's on their radar. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is just from a formatting standpoint, and I don't know if I don't know if people want to know this, but what I would do differently is the way that I wrote the Medicare book. I would not write it that way a second time in the sense that on Kindle, the the book does not show up as well. It, it kind of formats a little bit weird. And that's because I used a lot of bullet points. Mm-hmm. And the way that bullet points work in Kindle, it doesn't look super appealing. So it looks like it's in some cases where that where it's a bullet point heavy area it looks like it's formatted incorrectly when in reality it's formatted perfectly. It just doesn't work as well on Kindle versus I would recommend to anybody that if you're going to buy the book, buy it on, buy a paperback because it does work better. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, um, so I would just say that if you're, if you're going to write a book and you want it to be both on Kindle and paperback, maybe to stay slightly away from the bullet points. So like my next book is going to have, very few bullet points because I, I want it to look pretty. Um, you know, I want the reading experience to be solid no matter what you're reading it on. 
And see, my mind would lead to, well, how many of my customers or how many of my readers are going to be buying it on Kindle? And if they're not buying it on Kindle, then I may not worry about it as much. If I, if I think that the bullet points would be an easier read on paper and that's where most people are going to buy it. And I do agree. I think this, I think a book like this is a book that you want to be able to open up and thumb through real quick and be able to make notes. And I know you can do all that stuff on Kindles and maybe you know, I love technology. I still don't like reading on tablets. Like I like the physical book. Um, so maybe I'm a little biased there, but I, I feel like if a lot of people aren't buying on Kindles, then how big of a deal is it about the formatting? I'm a physical book fan, no question about it. That is my preference. Um, so I'm pretty thrilled with how it came out on in paperback. It looks really nice, I think. Um, Could you submit? I, is this possible to submit to formatting? Could you submit to Amazon a paper formatting and then a Kindle formatting? Do you know? You do. You do that separately. Oh, but um, it's the bullet points. That's right. So you'd have to go back and actually rewrite everything and change the writing. That's right. Okay. Correct. So they are submitted separately, even in two different formats. So like for Kindle, you sub, you actually upload your Word document. And then uh, for the paperback, you actually upload a PDF. Gotcha. Um, you submit them separately anyway, but it just the bullet points just don't work as well. So my future books won't have the bullet points. And then version 2.0 of Medicare will not have uh, – I'll probably rewrite it to be less bullet point fashion uh, just to make the reading experience better. I'll tell you though, it surprised me the number of people who bought Kindle mm-hmm. uh, thus far. Um, probably about 25% of the books sold have been on Kindle. Okay. Um, so, you know, who that is, that that may be, you know, a lot of advisors that are buying it on Kindle rather than end users. I really don't know because it doesn't, I get I get analytics in the sense that I get, well, I don't really get analytics. I get told how many of what has been purchased. That's all I really know. Um, But just food for thought for anybody who does want to write, if you're going to write and you want it both Kindle and paperback to probably skip, minimize the bullet points. Okay. That's, that's good. Especially if we're writing more, um, you know, planning focused thing, bullet points lend themselves to a lot of that, like academics type of writing. So that's good to know. Well, you hit my, my next question was two to three things you changed. You already hit those. Um, so in, before we get to the ending question um, and wrapping things up, any, anything that I forgot to ask, anything that's popped in your mind that you think is important for advisors that are considering writing a book to, to, to know? Um, no, I would just say to create kind of many goals instead of, you know, I mean, I know we said that already, but, that was really helpful for me was probably the most, and I don't know why I decided to do it that way. I didn't read anybody that said to do it that way, but I was like, all right, well, I think I just started out there. It's like, all right, I'm just going to try to knock out one chapter this week. That's it. And then from there, it just kind of snowballed into, well, I'm just going to write one chapter every week. So if you, if you're going to write, I would dedicate yourself to the research on the front end. Don't try to research and write at the same time, do all your research because it's going to help coordinate your thoughts and how you want to structure your book. So that's, that's probably the best tip I have research first, write Second, and then, you know, commit to a writing schedule, like have an end goal for every single week and then stick to your goal. Sounds good. And that could apply to blogs and everything else as well. So it's uniform. totally all right. So the final question for everybody has nothing to do with your book, but over the last year or so, what have you discovered recently that's had a drastic change in the way you're working with your clients or running your practice? And maybe this is a COVID change that you've had, but any, anything major for your practice? So the best thing I've done has actually occurred within the last month, and that is, uh, which I shared with you already, which is the idea of writing a monthly memo. Um, so I, I use ConvertKit for my blog. So I just started using uh, ConvertKit for a monthly memo to clients. And it is designed to be read by clients only. So it's not going on the blog or anywhere else. It's a kind of a exclusive private memo, though anybody can sign up. It's not exclusive in the sense that other people can't sign up. It's just not available out there. You have to be sent the link. Um, but I wrote and sent my first one uh, last uh just two days ago, I think. And the response I got from it was phenomenal. Like by far the best response I've gotten from anybody in the sense that 
they felt like I was communicating directly to them. Like when I first started the blog, I thought, all right, this will be a neat communication tool with clients. And while almost all of my clients read it, it's not as personal, but I got a ton of great feedback on the monthly newsletter. So, you know, you've, I know you've harped on monthly newsletters, but, or weekly newsletters. Um, obviously I know you, um, you know, the advisor of tomorrow newsletter, I told you before we were even on here, uh, that yours is one of three, uh, emails that I really, really, really look forward to, uh, every other week now yeah. instead of every week. Um, so for everybody's on here, plug for Justin's newsletter. If you're not on advisor of tomorrow newsletter, sign up for that. Um, it's literally one of my favorite newsletters. So I just took that same approach. I follow us. I follow a, um, you know, a pro, I follow a template, if you will. I develop what I thought might be a good template to share with clients every week. So they know what to expect. I think there's benefit to that consistency of, of form. And uh, like I said, I sent my first one two days ago and was overwhelmed at the response in terms of how much they liked it. Email. Um, so- Email is something that advisors are, are, I think, missing out on. Um, and I, I'm guilty of it. And the, the, uh, the eye-opening experience was doing the advisor of tomorrow. And real quick, what, what was the, like, the subject of the memo? Was it like breaking down what's going on in the markets or was it more kind of philosophical type content? Like, what did you write to your, to your uh, clients? Well, I'm happy to share the structure of it. So I, the structure I have is I have four sections. Um, the first section is is market returns, which isn't actually where I pin any value whatsoever. Um, but because people are always curious and I'm transparent, I'm like, look, here's the market returns. Like I'm half year to date market returns. Um, and I don't try to avoid the negative market returns. It just is what it is. Um, so market returns is section one. That's super simple and straightforward. Then the second section is financial and investment planning, which is I literally referred to this in uh, kind of the preamble that my hope is that my market commentary is like vitamin C for their, uh, you know, for their resilience. I'm a very positive person on the market overall. I think that optimism is the only realism because it's the only thing that squares with historical records. So I don't really, so I abide by that. I live by that. Clients know that about me. And so it's a very it's information about the markets, but it's written in a very positive form, but it acknowledges the uncertainties. It acknowledges the fear. It acknowledges like feelings they may be having, um, but finish with a positive tone all throughout. Um, and then the third section is just resources, which is I only included two articles, which are things I think they may enjoy reading. And then the fourth section is, and maybe the most interesting and the most responded to is personal. So I wrote probably three or four paragraphs on what what life during the coronavirus has been like in my household. You know, I shared some uh, games, physical games that we've been playing with the boys, like Quirkle. If anybody doesn't ever play Quirkle, it's it's a fantastic little game. Um, and we play with seven, our seven year old. We play Yahtzee, Monopoly. But I just shared like what we've been doing, and then I I finished with a question, which was, you know, I'm curious how you've been spending your time during the virus. Like, what's what's life been like? So my thing is to my hope is to, uh, you know, open up, use this as a way to open up a line of communication each and every month. And I, I'm telling you, I mean, the response was I was overwhelmed. It was it was very nice and uh, probably the most excited I've been in terms of something I've done Uh in a long time. The inbox is a very intimate place that I didn't under, understand that before. But when somebody lets you into their mailbox, like in their inbox, that's like you're getting permission to go somewhere that most people don't go, that they get sent to spam or deleted right away. If they choose to bring you in, that's very inviting and a very positive thing. What I've found is with the news, the emails I've started sending clients, the ones that have nothing to do with like returns and planning and all those are the ones that get the greatest feedback. So I'm in a real big kick about finding a mission statement and I'm actually revamping my whole planning process to be more focused on developing a mission for your plan and then aligning your plan with that mission. Like for new clients coming on, that will be a part of the onboarding process is we will, we will come up with a mission statement. 
existing clients. I'm not going to force them, but I'm going to encourage them. So I sent an email out about the mission, shared my mission with them, and then kind of went on about how we're going to align it. And that little drawing I made, uh, thanks to Visualize Values Inspiration, I put that in there. And I've built out, I need to record some videos, three more emails that I'm going to send to my clients to walk them through the process of determining their mission. And I've already gotten, like it doesn't sound like a lot, but I've already gotten six or seven emails back. I had one client say, we're super competitive. We hope we're the first ones back. But they sent me their mission statement already. Um, and, and, And those responses, but then I've had phone calls with clients and they've all referenced this email that had nothing to do with what's going on in Corona. It was basically to let them know that we have this chance to refocus on what's most important in our lives and we can center our plan around that. And, and this time is actually, I think, showing us what are the things we value the most. Like we had so much going on before when we were running our regular lives. And now that we've been confined, you know, stuck in our house, we're realizing that some of those things we thought were important really weren't that important. And when we come out on the other side, maybe we're going to go back to doing those things because they don't really align with what we want and we reconfigure things. So it's just kind of like resetting. But the whole point to that is I got a lot of engagement off of that email from responses and phone calls, and I always never wanted to send email. So now my goal is once I get through this mission is what's another little mini email campaign that I can do for my clients that will enrich the experience, enrich what we do, but has nothing to do do with breaking down what the markets are doing or breaking down Medicare, whatever it might be. It's more bigger picture and helping them live a better life, which is a part of creating a good financial plan. So- um, I just was curious what your memo was like. So I'm not surprised that the personal side, which is what people really are most attracted to, is what resonated with them. It's the same thing with my mixtape. Every week now, I always put pictures of the boys. I did it for fir- at first because it was fun. And then I have clients who say, I only open your Sunday email so I can see pictures of the boys. And I'm like, all right, well, if that's what gets you to open, maybe one day you'll find something there worth reading. But they they want to see the boys. They want to see the human side of things. And especially if it's going to your client's you already have that relationship. They're vested in you and they want to see that you're happy. They want to see that your family is doing well and they want to know what's going on. Um, so I, I love that idea. So All right. right. I, I learned very quickly that I did not realize that you could communicate in mass intimately. Mm-hmm. And I learned that very quickly that that's clearly what the overall feeling was, is that it was a, a one-to-one email even though it was written to all of my clients. And that's genius. The scale of that, like you're communicating with all of your clients with one hour's worth of writing rather than calling every single one of them and having a similar level. Maybe a call would be a little bit more personal, but it's still resonating with them and you're doing less work for it. So it's, it's smart. I I think it's, it's great. Like as I talk to more advisors, I'm going to encourage them to find ways that, you know, while we're trying to build the outside growth, make sure that you're taking care of the inside of your company and keeping clients happy and leveraging email to, to do that. Um, well, real quick before we wrap up, I, I did want to take this opportunity to just kind of praise you and your friendship. So you've been on the show a bunch, talking shops, been on the podcast, uh, but just publicly want to thank you for being one of my biggest supporters and pushing me, sending me essentialism, trying to help me become more productive and be better and chase my goals. I mean, I have a lot of friends in the profession, but not everybody is as vested in me as, as you are. So publicly, I wanted to share that and just let everybody know how great of a guy you are, um, advisor, parent, spouse, friend, um, and just thank you for all that you do. And I'm not going to let you say anything back. So with that- The feeling is mutual. The feeling is mutual. All right. I'll, I'll let that go. Um, so with that, I, I, I want to thank you for taking the time. Again, congratulations on the book. Uh, everybody listening or watching, Ashby has been very generous. He's going to give away a few copies. So for the first three people, again, asking for reviews is awkward. This is my way to work around that. For the first three reviews on iTunes, um, honest reviews, you can tell me it sucks, but first three reviews, take a screenshot and email um, to jc at justincastelli.io, the email. Email me a screenshot of your review on iTunes for the podcast, and the first three will get a copy of Ashby's book um, on us. So... He's been very generous doing that, so I appreciate that. Um, and he's helping me get over my fear of asking for reviews, which is what we're supposed to do. Um, so, so with that, um, Ashby, I appreciate you and your time. Uh, everybody go out and make sure you get Medicare Simplified. If you're an advisor, it's a must-have because you need to know this stuff. 
and it is a small book. It won't take up a lot of space and you can very discreetly look at it if you don't want your clients to know you're referencing Ashby's knowledge to help you out. So go grab the book. The links will be in the show notes. Ashby, thanks again. Everybody, thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next episode. 